So let's get started. Okay. Um, we've kind of agreed um, that a good place to start would be uh, talking about what eugenics is. Um, from my perspective as an historian, eugenics is a social, or rather was, a social and political movement that was popular on the first half of the 20th century. Uh, it was a movement which had, was literally worldwide. Was. There were eugenics movements in Asia, there were eugenics movements in North America, in South America, in Central America, um, and of course also in Europe and in England. And each of those movements had a slightly different political goal. So there were eugenics movements that were interested in and wanted to improve the race, uh, whatever race it was that the eugenicists favored. Uh, they wanted to improve the race by controlling of the people they thought were defective. But there were also eugenics movements, for example, in France that had a completely different take on what eugenics meant. I mean, the word itself means good birth or good breeding. Um, and in France, eugenics meant um, mothers, uh, financial su supplements to mothers, um, public health measures to control, control syphilis, syphilis so that so babies wouldn't be born with incipient syphilis or wouldn't be born blind, which is one of the consequences of a syphilitic infection in a woman. Um, and so there were hereditarian eugenicists and there were environmentalist eugenicists. So the ones we, the eugenicists we think badly of, uh, for very good reasons, are the ones who practiced what historians call negative eugenics. And that was, um, prohibiting the reproduction of, or trying to prohibit the reproduction of people that they deemed defective in one way or another. And the two places in which those movements achieved some political success were the United States and uh, Nazi Germany. And it's those, and those set of practices that give uh, eugenics a bad name, that is, sterilization of um, presumed defectives, both in the United States. I believe every state of the union had a law uh, either mandating or permitting um, elect some appointed officials um, to uh, sterilize people who were regarded as defective. In, the, in Nazi, Nazi Germany, Germany there were, there were sterilization, sterilization laws. laws. Uh, but, uh, but there were there also laws, laws um, prohibiting the marriages of certain individuals. And there were laws that remanded defective individuals to institutions. And um, in some of those institutions, um, the ultimate eugenics was practiced. That is, the residents were killed. That's my definition of eugenics, too. Uh, I think that's a really useful way to begin the conversation uh, with the specific history uh, located in in time and in cultures to give our listeners a sense of of what eugenics is as historically practiced. The kinds of questions that I'd like to engage in um, would be the questions that come out of maybe um, Philosophy, uh, although I'm not a philosopher, but um, the questions that I would want to ask have to do with um, what we mean by uh, human, what we mean by flourishing, what we mean by uh, health, these kinds of questions that I think are really important to put in conversation with the actual history of eugenics as it has been developed and, and practiced. So a definition which does not conflict with yours, but I think complements it, that I would want to offer is to 
think about eugenics as um, a way of shaping human communities or shaping human populations. And although eugenics itself, the word, as as you well know and has pointed out, have pointed out, comes from a very specific history uh, within the development of medicine and science. Um, in some sense, what we might call eugenics, that is to say the shaping of human communities, has been practiced in lots of different ways over the course of history. Um, the crudest way, obviously, to shape a population is um, sort of ethnic cleansing, um, which historically has been done, um, and the kind of shaping of human populations that took place during the very specific era that you're um, referring to um, is a different kind of shaping, but still the hand of culture and the hand of various groups is involved in determining, uh, to use Ruth Hubbard's phrase, who should and should not inhabit the world. And the questions that I'd like to raise that I, I think are interesting are about what kinds of beliefs and what kinds of assumptions shape that shaping. Okay, I think that actually that's a terrible definition uh -huh. of eugenics because if you regard uh, eugenics as the effort to shape populations in a particular way, then everything in culture could be called eugenics. For example, we try to shape um, American culture through education. Mm -hmm. And education is not a eugenic practice. Or if you want to call eugenic education a eugenics practice, um, then we're talking about something completely different. Mm -hmm. What Ruth Hubbard, what disability rights activists object to, they call eugenic selection. Mm -hmm. Okay, and that's something completely different from the effort to shape populations. I mean, there are a huge number, I mean, all of culture is an effort to socialize individuals into a particular culture, in which case we're shaping when we send kids to preschool. We're shaping when we agree to bilingual education. That's true. Or prohibit bilingual education. That's it's a particular kind of shaping that eugenics was about, and that's a biological shaping, it's a shaping by selection of those individuals who ought to have children and ought not to have children. Exactly, and that's the kind of shaping that I would want to talk about, but um, I think that the term shaping is an appropriate one to use, and I'd like to um, continue to try to use it in our conversation because it allows me to ask some of the questions that I think would be interesting for us to talk about. 